Thank you very much all for coming to the, op to the side event on, uh, on data protection. Um, uh, to you, to, to, to my distinguished guests, um, there were two side events. There's not a side event in Ukraine, and you understand that a number of um, MPs here are also very worried about the um, events over there. Um, it's uh, broadcast live. I know a number of people are following it. Also very welcome. Um, today it is Data Protection Day. And it's a convenient reminder that our privacy on the internet is a right which needs protection. Mr. Snowden has revealed to us the extent to which this right is endangered. And endangered is actually a very weak word. Um, actually, pretty much all we do, especially if you're as lousy as I am with your internet security, is under surveillance. As the Parliamentary Assembly's rapporteur on mass surveillance, and by the way, on um, uh, protecting whistleblowers who do something about it. I'm preparing a report which will take stock of the threats to our rights and develop some proposals how we can deal with these threats and protect our rights of privacy and how it can be balanced with legitimate interests in national security. I'm very grateful that our experts today, Mr. Applebaum and Mr. Grothoff, uh, Grothoff from the technological side and my compatriot, Mr. Korf from the legal side, are ready to share our ideas with us. I'll give the meeting the floor for about 10 to 15 minutes, and afterwards you can ask questions. If there are any questions in the meantime for clarification, please raise your hands. Oh, yes. <laughs> and so, very warm welcome to Ms. Leuthuizer Starnberg um, back here. And um, your work on Mr. Magnitsky four and a half years ago did find its uh, follow up today. Former State Minister, or former State Minister of Justice in Germany. Mr. Applebaum. That's a tough act to follow. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. It's really quite an honor um, to be invited to speak, especially with these two gentlemen. Um, I guess if I were to try to tell you something today that would be meaningful. Don't worry. Nothing <laughs> President <good>. Obama. <laughs> 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 what I would tell you is that I don't have a lot of good news, and um, I also want to start by saying that I don't think that we should despair at this fact, but I want to sort of uh, answer this question which is posed on the flyer here, which is, do these practices amount to a violation of the human right to privacy, and what are their consequences in terms of rule of law and democracy? So what I would say is that the answer to that is clearly a yes. And what are the consequences? We don't need to look significantly further than Germany to understand those consequences. So I'm one of the journalists, so strangely I wear two hats. I work with the Tor project, and as the Tor project I do some software development and some public advocacy, and I train people about security and privacy and anonymity on the internet. At the same time, I also do some freelance investigative journalism. So I'm one of the journalists that revealed with Der Spiegel that uh, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel was being spied on by the NSA. So that was my story with uh, Marcel Holger and Laura Poitras. And this, um, this is, to me, a perfect example about the second part of that question, which is what are the consequences in terms of rule of law and democracy? Look at the fact that we know that the NSA has spied on Merkel potentially since 2002 under uh, alleged uh, SIGINT ruling, this uh, NSRL 2002-388. And what we will see is that if I had done that spying on Merkel, I would be in prison today. Straight up. The general uh, prosecutor, the federal prosecutor of Germany, however, is not sure if they'll open a case about Merkel being spied upon by the NSA. And of course, it goes without saying that the other tens of millions of Germans that are being spied upon, or myself as a, a resident of Germany, I live in Berlin, um, there is not even a question about whether or not a case will be opened about our privacy or Christian Grutoff's privacy living in Germany. And that, I think, answers the second question. So what is the consequences? That there are two rules. The rules for myself, for Christian Grutoff, for other people, and the rules for people as they might apply to the NSA. And that is a very serious problem because the rule of law is supposed to be something that is equally applied to all, and not merely a matter of class privilege. So that, to me, is part of the motivation for working on this investigative journalism. So I'm going to take off the Tor hat for a moment and talk a bit about what this means. And I'm going to talk about the architecture of surveillance without being too technical, because I was asked very politely to not be too technical. So um, 
If you have specific technical questions, I'm more than happy to answer them until I leave in six hours. Um, I'll need some coffee, though, if you're going to hold me for that long. Um, but there exists a couple of systems that the NSA runs, and they're not so different than systems that every country in the world would like to build, or at least that some countries in the world have built. So if you look at any embassy, one of the things that we revealed with uh, Chancellor Merkel being spied upon was that the US embassy had uh, dielectric panels around certain parts of the embassy. And what those are, those are radio transparent walls, meaning it looks like a wall, but if you put surveillance equipment on the other side of the wall, the wall does not interfere with receiving radio signals. It's just an easy way to say, you have something that looks like a wall, but actually it's part of a big surveillance system. So the way that this system works is it does what's called dragnet collection, or they call it bulk collection, which is just a nice way of saying mass surveillance. What it does is it intercepts all of the radio communications that are in the general vicinity of these receiving devices. Now, these receivers process that data and make it meaningful to the electronic signals filtering systems on the other side of that dielectric panel on the other side of that wall. There are many programs which I would encourage you to look into. We've written about them extensively in Der Spiegel, um, but the turmoil program, the quantum programs, the turbine program, the Q fire system, these systems show how you can have a single set of sensors in a bunch of buildings around the world, network them together, and then use them for dragnet surveillance, targeted surveillance, and then weaponize them in order to begin to attack people based on the information that you see. So for example, if Christian Gruthoff was targeted by the NSA, he has a specific email address, he has potentially, I believe, a cell phone with a SIM card in it, he has a unique identifier on his cell phone as well as the SIM card itself. And when this dragnet surveillance system observes a signal that includes any of the selectors, which is what you might call an email address, or you might call an MC or an IMEI on a phone, or an email address that just is the domain part of the email address, in fact, um, then this system will pick that up, look to see what other communications are associated with it, and it will record those in an automated fashion. And in some cases, in the case of the quantum program, the GCHQ and the NSA together maintain a system which can automatically attack a person's computer system, break into it, and implant a backdoor that will allow them to remotely control this system. And that can happen in an automated fashion. You simply find the selectors that are interesting about a target, and then you can automatically have these systems attack and basically colonize these electronic systems. So if Christian Grutoff, being the model citizen that he is, has a regular GSM telephone, and he is one of the people that is targeted, and I'm not saying he is, but he probably is, then it is the case that in an automated fashion, without any judicial oversight whatsoever, without any other kind of human interaction, once he is tasked, these systems go to work, and any place his cell phone shows up on a uh, cell phone network, any place his computers show up on the internet, all of the associated unique identifiers or selectors will be used as a way to tip the system to begin to attack his computer systems and to try to maintain persistence on those systems. So if any of you do anything politically relevant that is ever not in the interest of the people that control this system, then it is the case that they may task you for selection. And if you believe that you might be exempt, you should ask Chancellor Merkel if she thought that too. It is probably the case that she thought it unthinkable, but she is not the only one that was targeted under NSRL 2002-388. In fact, many other people in Germany are targeted by that NSRL alone, and there are many other NSRLs that are relevant. Um, in fact, the United States government in general and the NSA seems to love targeting democratic institutions of power, specifically because this is surveillance in support of hegemony. It is not in support of counterterrorism, as they often suggest. It's a mission creep. So the turmoil system is, if you want to think about it in this way, like a big eye. And anything that passes in front of the eye, it is compared against a list of things that are interesting or a list of patterns and behaviors that are interesting. The quantum system is a suite of families that can do many different <coughs> things, but generally speaking, <coughs> attacks the computer systems, telephones, or the people in some sense. GCHQ has a similar thing, but it actually aims to interfere with the people's lives. So for example, what they do with the surveillance system uh, is that they actually interfere with hotel reservations, for example. Um, this is uh, their um, 
Royal Valet Service, I believe is what they call it. And this is a thing where they see a reservation flow across the internet in the form of an email. And since they are reading the contents of every email for interesting things, they then know to interfere. They know to deploy an asset to the hotel. They know to cancel the reservation so that the person has a hard time checking in. And these are the kinds of petty things that can be done with things that are like the quantum suite, but also in this case, the, the Royal Valet. The turbine system is actually the injection. So if turmoil is deep packet inspection, spying on everything, turbine is deep packet injection, which is tampering with everything that seems to be interesting. And the Q fire system is a way to tie all of this together in real time in an automated fashion and to ensure that it happens in the fastest possible way. So um, in some cases, it is the case that other machines which have nothing to do with the National Security Agency or GCHQ are actually repurposed and used as relays for data for either exploit payloads or for other uh, interesting relays of data that are necessary. So home routers which have vulnerabilities built into them that have nothing to do with these intelligence services that are essentially hijacked. Uh, the Third Amendment of the, uh, of the United States Bill of Rights uh, suggests that quartering of soldiers uh, not during wartime is a, basically a tyranny and uh, it should not be allowed. And I would argue that if you repurpose the electronic equipment inside of my home in such a way that that would not be so different than quartering soldiers themselves, especially when ser uh, used in service of committing what would otherwise be a crime. Uh, if I were to do any of these things or to build any of these systems, each one of these systems represents a, a myriad of felonies, essentially. It's dragnet surveillance, it's tampering with uh, these communication platforms, it's installing software in a, there's almost no difference between this and what we see the Russian business network doing. For example, when they wish to take control of internet banking credentials or to otherwise harm people's computers. So what that means is that selector-based surveillance is kind of the big threat. It's the dragnet surveillance. And what I hope that we showed with Chancellor Merkel being spied upon was how it actually works now. We do not exist in a world of wiretapping anymore. It's not someone with headphones tapping one wire. It's actually whole life surveillance. Everywhere you go, everything you touch, every unique identifier that you have, it shows where you've been, it goes into databases, those databases show geographic information, they show economic ties, they show all sorts of political affiliation, gender, sexual orientation, you name it. That information is pilfered from private companies, it's sometimes coerced from private companies, and strong encryption, anonymous communication systems, and actual integrity in our, in our actual electronic systems are the way to counter it. So the Tor project which I work on, we build an anonymity system which I hope that all of you will use. And part of the reason that it exists is that we wanted to ensure that people would have the right to free speech and the ability to read freely. And that's something which we wanted to have as an option. So it wasn't just an abstract idea, it was a real thing. And what we found is that dragnet surveillance is thwarted by this type of technology, specifically because you cannot do selector-based surveillance when the information flowing across these traffic links is encrypted. We encrypt it in a forward secret way. And we do this in such a way that we hope that this means that unless you are being extremely targeted, the dragnet surveillance is really pushed away. The way of doing selector-based surveillance is pushed away. In some cases, when you leave the Tor network, there may be some issues. That is, if they are monitoring exits of the Tor network, when you leave the anonymity network itself, you'll have the same set of problems, which is to say we actually need secure communication systems on top of anonymity systems. So if, for example, you want to use a webmail uh, like Gmail, and at the end of the day, Gmail gives this data up to the NSA, it will not make much of a difference that you have used Tor. We need a holistic picture. Anonymity is just one part of it. But strong encryption where the only people with the keys are the users themselves is a must. And so in this sense, we have committed with the Tor project to never add a backdoor. Because when law enforcement uses our system, if we have a backdoor, we are a target of things like, for example, Mexican drug cartels, Russian business network, you name it. So we want to build actually secure systems where the users are in control of their own fate and where the systems themselves deliver on the promises that they make, as opposed to falsely advertising, as is the case with many other electronic communication systems. So I hope that that explains a little bit about the architecture of surveillance. I know that that was really a fire hose of information and hopefully not too technical. I would encourage you to read everything we've written in Der Spiegel in the last six months. Most of it is also in English as well as in German. 
If nothing else, just look at the leaked documents and interpret it as you wish. But a key thing to understand is that people often trot out child pornography, the war on some drugs. Child pornography is, of course, the, the, the favorite, but terrorism, it's absolutely a serious problem. And of course, it is you know money laundering as well. These things, though, generally speaking, they are not affected. People who are willing to commit crimes are often willing to commit many crimes at once. And it is everyone in this room who is the most impacted by this surveillance technology. It is not the, the Mexican drug cartels who run their own telephone networks without back doors. They have no trouble with this. It is Chancellor Merkel and the democratic institutions in Germany that have the most problems with this, right? There's a transitive risk problem. So people will suggest that we must keep our systems weak in order to fight against basically people who would wish to exploit these systems. Uh, but this is, I think, quite a serious fallacy. And I hope that Christian will describe how the current internet is completely compromised in a different way and how we can decentralize these systems in order to make them more secure. And I hope that um, we'll also hear quite a lot about the legal issues because I do believe that it is extremely illegal. And if I were the one perpetrating these things, um, I would imagine that I would not be here today. So I hope that uh, that will take place. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks, Jake. That is, um, I hope for many people here, not totally new, uh, but we are all under mass surveillance. Uh, a few days ago in America, the um, Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, appointed by President Obama, came out with a report that clearly said that everything that was happening with regard to American communications, American internet activity, was unlawful and unconstitutional, contrary to American law. Now, forget a bit for a second the distinction between U.S. persons and non-U.S. persons. From my perspective, as an international human rights lawyer, doing a lot of work with the Council of Europe, I can confirm exactly the same from a European perspective. I've um, asked for this page to be handed out that summarizes my analysis of the surveillance systems under the European Convention of Human Rights. I haven't got the time to go into the details. But what you can see is that the case law of the European Court of Human Rights just behind me there, those two little um, salt and pepper pots, um, very clearly indicates that mass surveillance is fundamentally contrary to the rule of law, very fundamentally contrary to the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, fully contr uh, contrary to major constitutions from Romania to Germany, of course, and other constitutions in Europe, utterly unacceptable. There was an article um, reporting on the PCLOB report saying, it is manifest that mass surveillance is screamingly unconstitutional. A very good article that was. I can say exactly the same here. It is absolutely obvious that mass surveillance as perpetrated by the NSA and by GCHQ is screamingly in violation of the European Convention of Human Rights. So let me pick out uh, not the details because you can read those. It's not just pool details. You can read a lot more detail in the paper from which it was taken. Um, let me come up with a few of the points that come out, come out of this. Um, the case law of the, uh, of the court is largely abstract because the court has never been aware of the actual practices of the NSA and, and GCSQ. So it's been acting on the basis of what the laws in Germany or the UK say rather than on the basis of what was actually happening. What is happening raised a whole host of issues. European Convention of Human Rights, the question of uh, jurisdiction on the internet, question of cybercrime, we've got Alexander Sega here um, of the cybercrime unit of the Council of Europe, um, the application of Article 32 of the Cybercrime Convention, the pooling of data by law enforcement agencies across borders, uh, respect for sovereignty and respect for the inviolability of international institutions. I'll not go into those. I just want to make a few very simple points apart from uh, the screaming, uh, uh, screamingly obvious illegality of these systems in terms of European uh, Council of Europe and EU and national European laws. The first is, just to repeat what Jake also said, that these systems are not used only to fight terrorists and pedophiles. They are um, used for economic spying and for political spying in a wide way that in no way can be said to be covered by the exceptions of national security in the European uh, international treaties. What is also important in that respect is that the EU has some limitations with regard to national security. 
those limitations are not complete, and I've um, given evidence to the European Parliament's um, Civil Liberties Committee on that, saying that the EU does have the right to interpret what is and what is not covered by national security, for instance. More important here is that the Council of Europe is not encumbered in that way. The Council of Europe has uh, a jurisdiction over, over matters irrespective of whether they fall under the rubric of national security. And therefore, uh, I welcome very much the appointment of Peter Omtzigt as a rapporteur for the Parliamentary Assembly, because he does not have to um, blinker his eyes when it comes to matter of national security. He has the right and the duty to inquire into, uh, into what's happening there. The, e the, the Council of Europe really is the, the first and the foremost of the European institutions in this particular case, it is the appropriate body to address this issue. Then the final point I'm trying to make very briefly, yeah. um, spying happened in the wars, particularly of course in the Second World War, um, and then it started continuing in the Cold War. And for many, many decades, we as Europeans have left it in the shadows. We were happy to let the spies play their John le Carre games uh, in the shadows somewhere, and as long as they only bumped each other off occasionally, we weren't too bothered about it. What has been the consequence of the revelations of Snowden, for which he must be greatly complimented, is that what is happening in the shadows has been the sprouting of an enormous beast, and the beast should be tamed. In very simple terms, we cannot have a world, we cannot have a Europe, in which the rule of law does not apply to certain state activities. Very simple point, and I hope the Parliamentary Assembly will confirm that point. The rule of law must be applied to the activities of secret agencies of the state as much to, as to any other agencies. Yes, they need special rules, but they must be within the framework of the, of the court um, that the court has laid down. That framework is not clear. Um, the spying by UK and USA uh, is based on the UK-USA Treaty of 1946, um, which was only made public uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and there's still all kind of attachments to it that are secret. The um, treaties with um, Germany, between Germany and the Allies, were only recently made public in a very good book, uh, Überwachters Deutschland, um, that came out only recently. Um, many of the legal bases on which our state agent secret agencies operate are still secret or partially secret or hedged about with secret um, uh, memoranda and, and uh, appendices. That must be clarified. The laws must be made clear and that includes treaty law. Now, the Council of Europe has the power under Article 52 to demand, and I'm saying demand, not politely ask, to demand full information about all the legal parameters for all the activities of any state bodies that affect the human rights of individuals. The Secretary General only has to write a letter to every state asking for this information and every state is then required to oblige it. Several people, including the Libe um, Committee of the European Parliament, have called for the Secretary General to exercise those powers and I would like to reinforce that call. I hope this gives you a bit of a parameters. Let me go back to the basics. What is happening is massively illegal. It is in blatant violation of the European Convention of Human Rights. It totally disrespects the rule of law um, in the world and in the internet. We must come back to a reassertion of the rule of law, of law on the internet and in, in, in the digital world. And we must, for a start, clarify the rules under which these secret agencies are operating. Thank you. Um, let me begin by quoting Professor Dr. Hartmut Pohl, who is the speaker of the Working Group on Data Protection and Security of the Gesellschaft für Informatik, in a, it's a German professional IT association, uh, who wrote an article in this journal in uh, January this year. Uh, roughly the following, he, I'm, I'm translating, so roughly he says, 85,000 backdoors are being installed in strategic servers worldwide. These are the servers controlling nuclear power plants, electricity and gas supply, the food industry, financial and insurance companies, telecommunications, transportation, chemical and medical production systems. A blackout of one of these critical infrastructures, such as the wide range power outage, is likely to create the danger of a civil war within five days. This creates an imminent danger for the life and or physical condition of Germans, Europeans and humans 
in most industrialized nations. End quote. So this is not just about surveillance. Right? As we know from the nuclear age, it hardly matters if a friendly or hostile nation controls the trigger, as long as individuals can easily trigger mayhem. National security services deliberately preserving or creating vulnerabilities is thus the digital equivalent of the United States keeping the nuclear launch codes set to 0000. zero, zero, zero. Yes, eight hands, yes. <laughs> so what can we do about it today? For me, as a computer scientist, the first answer is that we meet, need to stop using proprietary software and moving to free software that allows us as the users to be in control of our computing. As long as our computing depends on proprietary software where Microsoft can voluntarily or be compelled to build in backdoors, where the NSA has these wonderful 100% success rates at compromising these systems, we are a colony. Free software is not about cost savings, it's about regaining control of our lives. That applies to states, to industry, and to individuals. And if the city of Munich was able to do this transition, I wonder why the rest of Europe can't. So in addition to minimizing the use of proprietary software and requiring the use of free software as much as possible, we need to minimize data collection. So right now, uh, I know there are still debates ongoing about data retention laws in Europe. Uh, about having mandates for legal intercept in telecommunications equipment. That's again, Europe mandating that European networks are insecure. We need to turn this around. Instead of saying, you know, you must at least collect this data or store this data for this amount of time, you must say, you, you must not store data that you do not need. You must not be able to intercept data on the network. That's where we need to go. And we can, of course, redesign the internet to make that much harder. Today's internet effectively functions like the postcard system. You send a postcard, it's easy to read for anybody who is sending what to whom. That's how the internet works. Now, there have been, in the recent decades, technologies developed that kind of, we could call the equivalent of an envelope. So we can put the letter into an envelope, and we don't even have to put the sender on it. The postal system is perfectly capable of routing letters to the destination without knowing the sender. So we can today use the Tor network to hide the sender and gain anonymity for our transactions, but we could also make that the default, that by default, the sender is not visible to the network that just routes the data. That is, of course, incompatible with surveillance technology, with current possibly legal mandates that say, you must record who is sending what to whom, but we could fix that. The internet has undergone technological transitions in the past, or is undergoing them right now with the IPv4 to IPv6 transition. So it's not like this is a static system we cannot change. The question is, do we have the political will to deploy these technologies uh, or to develop them? Other problems are that we're, again, still seeing the desire to centralize data collection. The Indians have built a great centralized national database of identity for a billion people. That's kind of like saying, okay, here's a wonderful target. Please hack me. Please break in. Now you know everything about our population. Avoiding centralized or even hierarchical trusted authorities in our societies will help us resist these kind of attacks. And we can, of course, build a more decentralized society if the state is willing to let us and not say we must have full control over every aspect of our citizens' lives. Recently, I looked at the Horizon 2020 budget of the European Union, this liberal democratic role model of a society, and looking at their research and development budgets, I found a privacy budget of five million over seven years and a surveillance budget of 90 million over the same duration. That tells me where the focus is these days, <laughs> especially since this budget was approved after Snowden's revelations. Now this is just the research budget. I do not have numbers on how much states spend on surveillance versus on privacy. But I'm pretty sure that the expenditures for certain secure phone technology deployed to the German chancellor is dwarfed by the amount that the German government spends or forces industry to spend for surveillance. So can citizens be expected to win a race, an arms race against both industry trying to collect data 
and authoritarian states? Or can we help them? That is essentially the big question. One thing we can try to make sure is that industry at least doesn't have an incentive. Right now, American companies have a business advantage. They can store and collect customer data, create personalized advertising campaigns, and that's a business advantage. And if European companies stick to European data protection laws, they just put it at a disadvantage. And the Euro Americans can just say, well, we are a safe harbor here. We can do all of this, right, and exploit these things. So if we level the playing field, either by technologically making surveillance and monitoring harder, or by legally penalizing violations of our privacy laws severely, we might have a chance to at least get industry on board, and of course, make Europe more competitive even. So to conclude, the main points I want to make, you really need to make free software mandatory, and you need to eliminate laws that are supporting the activities that uh, we're seeing these days, by the, these days by the NSA, like legal intercept and data retention. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much for three very... Uh, can you switch off your microphone? Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for three very clear introductions uh, with an overview of the revelations, uh, well, a partial overview, I can say, uh, from Mr. Applebaum, otherwise he wouldn't have been within the time. Um, on, on, on Mr. Korf, um, beware that in our report we do have um, a call for information from the Secretary General to the Member States. So we are proposing it. Uh, it will take a year and a half before the Parliamentary Assembly gets to vote uh, over it. And the 65,000 back doors and the sort of... I, I was hoping you are describing science fiction there, but... Um, <laughs> um, and you read the EU budget a bit better than I did um, over the last weekend, I, uh, I guess. But um, it, it does set uh, a scale of the problem. Um, I'll give the floor open to questions to each other. And also, if the speakers have comments on what the others say, then there will also be space for that. Yes, please, if you... Hi, first to say who, oops, who I am, not too loudly. My name is Martin Reichardt. I work at the Austrian delegation here at the Council of Europe. And um, so, yes, I'm a diplomat. It makes you wonder how, how many of my um, secret communications have remained so. Um, but really, um, my question uh, to, to the panel, and particularly, I think, to Mr. Applebaum, um, is, is more as a private person, as a user, uh, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, uh, concrete one, um, and then I have a, a further information for everybody here as well. But first, my question: um, I mean, part of the um, arms race, citizens' arms race against the against the uh, machines or, or industry, starts with with a certain sort of awareness of of, of autonomy of of of, of the problems. What, what sort of risk am I running by using this or that uh, platform? Um, I've never, somehow, for some reason or another, never chosen never to use uh, Gmail or, or Hotmail. I use, I've been using GMX ever since I've used uh, the email. Now, does that make my email more secure in legal or technical terms? And the legal, perhaps, is for Mr. Korf. Um, and then I would have a, a general information very briefly to, to everyone here. I mean, uh, um, Austria happens to run the Council of Ministers at the moment, and um, it, as everybody knows, hopefully, Internet privacy is one of all priorities. Our foreign minister has been there yesterday at the parliamentary assembly. I'm speaking about that as well. There he is on the homepage. Um, just to say, as part of this priority, we are running a conference about um, internet governance. It, it really is focused on the internet governance programs of the Council of Europe. So basically, what the Council of Europe can do in the future and do more uh, to um, to help this situation in among its member states. This is what we'll be dis discussing in Graz. Privacy is very much part of that. One panelist exclusively devoted to, to privacy, and we hope you to see you there in one form or another. Thank you. No. <laughs> it's not safe, though. Um, but I'll, I'll try to do one better than that. I'll give you a framework for evaluating this that has nothing to do with technology, but has to do with biology and biological systems. Imagine that you had asked about safe sex, and you had said that you had had unsafe sex in an area where you had unknown HIV rates. Is your behavior ultimately safe? And the answer is probably it is not safe and you're not taking a harm reduction approach to that behavior. Email is a lot like that. It's completely unsafe. The question is, how bad is the surveillance epidemic in the area in which you are emailing? 
and Germany is the most spied upon nation by the NSA, so, or at least in Europe. So that to me is a really, really serious problem if, for example, you use gmx.de. If you use gmx.at, the question is, is that hosted on the German servers? Is it actually hosted in Austria? Then that would be different. So then the question about the epidemic is what you think about that. And I suppose there's a question about um, that Macht in Deutschland campaign where they have some encryption between the GMX servers and uh, let's say T-Mobile and some others. But then we learn from the muscular surveillance programs that what the NSA actually does is they sniff the internal data center links, which have nothing to do with the security that was added during that uh, campaign to sort of exploit uh, the privacy awareness of the general population. So I would say that you would not be behaving in a safe way in the biological system. And you need to take a harm reduction approach with email using something like GNU PG, which is some uh, encryption for email. But another thing we can do is to change the way that these systems work. There are more secure systems than that. But basically, no, you're screwed. And I'm sorry to deliver you that news, but um, that's what happens when you let things get this bad. Well, at least I know. If I can make one tiny additional suggestion. So yes, you should use GPG to encrypt your email. Mm -hmm. The one thing, uh, GNU PG, the GNU Privacy Guard. Uh, but the one thing you can also do is not rely on a third-party mail provider. I am sure your organization might be able to set up a mail server for you, and if you use that, then at least your emails within your organization will not leave your organization, which might make it a bit harder, a bit harder. It doesn't make you safe, but it might make it a bit harder uh, for the dragnet to hit you. Also, one key point is it very much depends on the strategic versus tactical surveillance. So this is a little technical, but I think it's very important that you understand it. If you do things that are interesting in your work here in the Council of Europe, it is probably the case that you have some selectors about yourself that will be targeted. So no matter what system you use, those selectors may be present inside of those systems, and they may even cause your system to be exploited, which means that even if you are using something like GNU PG, there's a systemic issue, and those attackers will compromise your system, and there's almost no way to solve that problem. Um, at least I'd like to think that there are some big picture ways to solve it, but for you right now, defending yourself against the might of the NSA or GCHQ, you can forget it, it won't happen. Um, I'm sorry to say that. As someone who I think is targeted by that, I say that with some sorrow, um, but I think it is important to recognize that even if you run your own infrastructure, there's a transitive risk problem, and this is the big picture problem, which is that if you send an email from this system to the Council of Europe, the path between those two systems is what the NSA is monitoring. And so even if your server is perfectly secure, just as when society has no security, the internet is exactly the same. There is no security between the nodes in the network. And, and just, just to add one thing, nothing on the technical side, but when Jake says, when you are of interest, that does not mean that you're suspected of being a terrorist or a pedophile. You can be of interest just because you have, commer <laughs> because you have commercial uh, uh, information or because it's political information. It really is important to stress this because the comeback for both the UK and the USA government is constantly, we need this to fight terrorists and to stop bombs going off all over the place. That is not what they're using it for. There has just been a report in the United States again that looked at all the data in relation to terrorist offenses and found that even in that respect, the system isn't effective. It's neither its purpose nor is it effective in that particular area. It's important. And now this. <laughs> um, but what can, what should the politician do in this situation? I believe until today in uh, good governance, in good legislation. But what can we do to be effective? Threatened by mass surveillance, we all, the user, the uh, institutions, um, um, we all. But what should we do on the European, not on the national level, I think, okay, on the European level or at the international level here in the Council of Europe, a new convention, but in which direction, with um, what kind of technical rules or regulations to allow or to forbid? Can we do anything or have we to sit here and have to say the users have to protect themselves and that will not work? So um, I'll try to be brief because there's a lot to be done, <laughs> but the, the short version of it is every time you look at a law, 
and you see that it says that the system must be compromised in service of national security or so-called lawful interception, that's a vulnerability. Stop doing that, point one. The NSA wants you to believe that everyone spies and essentially it creates a trap for everybody that buys this lie. And any time anyone believes it or buys into this, they actually lose. So Germany has all these great processes, it has the Verfassungsgericht, it has this whole notion about justice and democracy and so on, and the NSA does not care at all about your laws or your democracy, and they just spy on people. So every time you choose to weaken a system, they win. What you need to do is look for all the places you weaken the system because you believe in your democracy, and then know that those are the weaknesses that the NSA will exploit, and that the GCHQ exploits, and not in theory, but did, to your chancellor. That's the first thing. The second thing is, mandatory deployment of free software and strong crypto that is end-to-end -end encrypted. And the next thing I would ask you to do is to have your national intelligence agencies target you and give you the result. Look at the result. Try to secure your communication. Buy secure communication devices. Watch them subvert it. Look at the result. Very few people can close that feedback loop. If you can do that, you will understand what is even beginning to be possible. And you could ask them what techniques they used. For example, they will break into apartments. So you should make sure laws make it so that they can't do that without strong judicial oversight, with very strong sanctions for stopping them from doing that. That happens in the United States in 100% of counterterrorism cases. But when WikiLeaks is considered terrorism, what is counterterrorism? It's a political thing. And I believe that actually happened to my house in the United States because of my association with WikiLeaks. So knowing that those types of things happen the law should stop those things from happening. And the key thing about telecommunications is to recognize that we need to actually return to an era where mandatory data retention is considered a vulnerability. It used to be that the Norwegian telecommunication systems, for example, did not keep these logs. They even had special meters that would run because their telecommunication systems were used by the occupying Nazi forces, in fact, to target the resistance. So they understood these vulnerabilities, and we've sort of lost that with cell phones and mandatory billing systems. So making sure that all these things where the state could do something useful, we recognize that maybe it on balance is not proportionate and that the NSA will not care about our notions of justice or proportion in a European context, and they, 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 and they don't. But Christian's point I think is really important, which is that free software at least gives us the, pl the ground to stand on to begin to evaluate that and to liberate ourselves in general. And I would really hope that you would help as poor Americans, frankly, to fix the problems in our country as well, because you're feeling some part of them, but we also have these problems, and it seems like we have lost the ability to have these discussions in, in Congress, for example. So. I'll throw in my, uh, my, my two minutes of, um, of legal worth. I mean, uh, this is going to be an enormous battle. I think it actually is, is a, uh, a battle about the very nature of the society in which we live. Um, and we have to start, like I said, by just simply reasserting the basic principle that the rule of law extends to all activities of every state and of every international institution, um, and to the interactions between states. I think actually um, the United States is, is not such a bad example in some respects. When it, I think the blowback there is going to lead to serious changes in the law, I hope anyway. Um, with regard to spying on Americans. That's the one and only thing in which they are still totally blind. There is very little, uh, very little argument being put forward in the United States for seriously limiting surveillance on non-US persons. And um, I think that's going to be a big, big battle. But I believe in the United States, the outcome of this will be much tighter controls on the NSA with regard to the spying on American citizens. Um, uh, because they do have these this sort of swings go, go of, the, of the balance swinging back. Um, and we should make sure that those improvements are going to be extended to non-US persons. And within Europe, we should take the lead on showing what should and could be done within, uh, in terms of data protection law and balancing them against national security. What we have at the moment is many laws and many treaties that simply say limitations can be made for human rights to the extent necessary for national security. And it's not spelled out how that balance is to be uh, sorted out. I think Jake is totally right. You want to start with strong protection of human rights, and then you want to be as tight as you can about any infringement in it for law enforcement or for national security purposes. And those two are blurring 
in any case in relation to terrorism in particular. It's going to be a very big fight, but we'll have to re This is what the Council of Europe stands for, protecting the, the rule of law in Europe. And, and this is a moment and when it is called to reassert its original purpose. I can't be more specific than that. Yeah, I want to first add that uh, you might, Jake might suggest that you ask your you know, national security service to break your own privacy and get feedback, but of course be aware that they lie to you, yeah. right? And so the first thing is you need to do is you need to protect whistleblowers really, really well, because otherwise you will not know what's going on in these agencies. If you don't do that, you know, you have no oversight either. Uh, on the side of strong data protection laws, I think that's a very good, important point. And of course, you have to have appropriate penalties. Ideally, I would like to be in a world where my data is on machines that I control, where it's not that I have to entrust anybody else with my data and that the network facilitates this, that I can have my communication with anybody else, but my data is never unencrypted anywhere but on my systems. And that, of course, has implications for this, what you said, trade-off between you know, fighting crime and uh, protecting civil liberties. What I would like to be is that the police effectively has to do traditional police work and has to get court approved physical access to my devices to inspect it for my data. So at least I will also know. As long as we try to do this on the network and in the network, that is the problem where it becomes mass surveillance as opposed to targeted surveillance. That where it becomes unaccounted surveillance because nobody can see exactly what's going on in the network easily. Whereas if it's really down to each of our individual devices, someone has to really break into Jake's apartment while well, he notices, right? So that's a, a progress over the case where you don't know if your phone calls were intercepted on the network. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you that was progress. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If I could add one thing, I would say, especially since you're from Germany, give Edward Snowden political asylum that's the answer. The answer is to respect the international law that shows that someone who faces persecution for telling the truth about major crimes, including crimes against humanity, the whole planet being spied upon, for example, and many of them being murdered by drone strike using that surveillance data. That's something which needs to happen. And I say that not as a tour person, just as a private individual. The fact that the whole of Europe has privately said that they cannot give Snowden asylum because of the pressure they receive that is an example of one of the impacts surveillance has on your democracies. Being a colony. Being a colony. So I hope that, thank you for that, I hope that it is important to understand that what Snowden would have, what Snowden can bring to this discussion is far more than all of us put together because he was one of them and understands how these systems work. And I hope that the international obligations that exist there may be taken up by one or two or all of the nations of Europe. Um, on the last point of view, Mrs. Snowden will be invited by the committee. I just got authorization for that. And now we're going to see in ways of making sure he's here. The Russian authorities, though usually not my best friends here, um, <laughs> as you're probably aware of, are cooperating fully into that one. Um, yes. I, um, as I was listening to uh, today's debate, um, uh, uh, you mentioned, I think it was uh, Professor Korf that mentioned that the Council of Europe is the right organization to have this discussion today. And also Microsoft was mentioned, uh, which I found very ironic and intriguing because in December, on December 3rd, there was a press release that the Council of Europe signed a cooperation agreement with Microsoft and the cooperation is ongoing since 2006. And I would just like to know your opinion about this sort of cooperation on the cybercrime project and cybercrime convention. Um, in, uh, in respect uh, that uh, specifically, you know, the project is to pr uh, work on the data protection and how, what, just what are your views? Thank you. Uh, it doesn't sound like too brilliant an idea to me um, and I would like to have a look at that um, agreement um, but I haven't looked at it yet. The other points you mentioned um, are very much discussed in the Council of Europe and as I said Alexander Seger is here as well as um, Sophie Krosny. Um, both the data protection convention is, is, is being reviewed and the cybercrime conventions being reviewed in particular with regard to the 
to cross-border access to data. I have made some very, very strong points at the Octopus Conference here in um, December, saying that I think um, cross-border access to data by law enforcement and by extension also by national security agencies without the consent of the targeted state is a violation of the sovereignty of the state and a violation of public international law generally and that the cybercrime convention shouldn't be used to underpin that. Um, I think the consensus, if, if a consensus it was, was a pretty broad agreement that um, this issue should be urgently reviewed to see if there is a need for uh, an additional protocol to the cybercrime convention or perhaps an additional protocol to the data protection convention or a new treaty that sits in, be in between. Uh, but it's interesting to see how these areas are, are coming together and need to be joined up. We're not there yet, uh, but we are at least beginning to recognize that there are major challenges and problems that need to be sorted out. And I would certainly agree that I wouldn't call in Microsoft to help me with that, but that's not my choice. Do you have anything to say about the choice of Microsoft, Jay? Yeah, I'm Microsoft, I mean, let's, let's look at some of the Snowden revelations here, and one of the things that I think that we'll see is that Microsoft will be coerced by the U.S. government to do things. The laws in the United States are quite bad. There's a German phrase for what I think has happened in the United States in the last 10 years. It's Gleichschaltung, right? We have a synchronization between uh, private industry, so-called, and the state. And the private industry is an arm of the state, and th what that arm does is a secret. And the fact of the matter is that Microsoft is filled with great people, but the law will make good people do terrible things. We don't know all of the details yet, but what we know is that it is very difficult to inspect the software that Microsoft produces because they do not give the four freedoms that the Free Software Foundation would ask free software to provide and that it does provide. So Microsoft, I think, is unfortunately in a hard position. If they make their software free software, and you can make them do that as a condition of buying any of their software, I bet, then maybe it would be worth having independent experts look at it. That's an important thing to understand. Don't just trust, but verify. And that's something we need to see happen. And when we see that happen, I think we'll be in better shape. And so there's nothing against Microsoft particularly here, although there's plenty against Microsoft for other reasons. <laughs> in this case, it's actually the laws in the United States that are the most concerning. And if you had similar laws here, you'd have the same problem. Free software solves some of that, but it doesn't solve all of that. Because if the software is free, but the data is stored in America, what have you done? Hello, my name is Lisa Limbach and I'm a German student of a diploma. I mean, <laughs> part of the reason um, is because it's like anything. We, we have to learn about it. It just takes time. I can't see you. There's a camera in the way. But uh, I mean, what we need to do is we need to have a consciousness raising, just like the feminists helped us to realize that women are people too. We need to recognize that the internet does not give it's true, and thank the feminists for doing that. That's really important work. The point is we need to have a similar consciousness raising about what it means to have anonymous communication systems and secure communication systems. Tor is only one tool in that toolbox. GNU-NET is another one. GNU-PG can help with parts of this. There are lots of systems out there like that. When it comes to journalism, though, in J schools, I, for example, I write with Der Spiegel as a freelancer. I didn't go to J school. I just started doing investigative journalism and working on these types of things. Um, but from what I understand about journalistic schools, they tend to not talk too much about technology or about the systems that people are using. Um, and they tend to not teach very much about operational security. Um, and while some discussions do go towards source protection, when the internet comes into play, it's just a complete disaster. So there exists a platform called Global Leaks, for example, and it's a distributed uh, platform for leaking documents that any journalistic organization should set up. I think J-Schools should teach journalists, individual journalists, to use that, to use off-the-record messaging, to use GNU-PG, to use Tor, but more they need to teach about systems and systems theory, and they need to, uh, there's a great artist, uh, Hans Hacke, a German artist, who I actually only recently learned about, um, and uh, he has these really good uh, critiques on systems. He has one about condensing water. We need to think about the systems that we actually interact with electronically when dealing with sources. And that's a really difficult thing and it's contextually very different. For example, Germany is a much freer country to work as a member of the press than the United States in a lot of ways, but not in others. Comparing and contrasting those legally and technically would be a really interesting exercise in J schools. And that might lead to people looking for systems like Tor and thus learning about Tor. I'm taking two very quick last questions. Um, I'm here for the Conference of International Non-Governmental Organizations. 
And I really want to come back to your first point to the question is in how far are these things actually having consequences in terms of the rule of law and democracy. Uh, and when I look at all the laws on, on data collection and being in Austria and living in Germany, I really have to thank Mrs. Neuthaus Schnarrenberger who validly fought against data collection laws in the last government, but the new government still is pressing to have that laws. But what does do that laws do? Every single citizen is viewed as a suspect, as a potential criminal, as a potential terrorist. And, and the consequence of that is my own mother, who is now 85 years old, just recently told me, when you use the telephone, be, be careful what you say, because you do not know who is listening. Sorry, if we are starting to think about what we are talking on the telephone in privacy, because we do not know who is listening, how can we still live in a free democratic state with the rule of law? Okay. It's impossible. Yeah. Mr. McNamara? I'm sorry that I'm late. I'm Michael McNamara is my name, uh, an Irish parliamentarian. Um, if this has already been dealt with, I do apologise. But uh, with regard to whistleblowers' legislation, I mean, if it's confined to disclosures to certain people, do you think that's adequate or should it cover disclosures to the media? I mean, if it excludes specifically disclosures to the media, if it's only a designated person. I mean, for example, if it's a, a designated person, then presumably it's somebody involved in state security if it's a disclosure with regard to a wrong in state security. I mean, they presumably know what they're doing, so they don't need to be told. Yep. Well, uh, the, the Council of Europe actually has guidelines on, uh, on whistleblowing uh, rules, and um, you should be able to blow the whistle outside your own organisation if the internal um, uh, methods aren't good enough. So organisations should have internal whistleblowing procedures, but I would not trust the NSA's internal whistleblowing procedures, for, for example, or the GCHQs. Um, I think there must be a public interest defense to the leaking of state secrets in any case whatsoever. And I think that also flows from Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, and if there is a serious public interest in a particular issue to be debated, then by law, by human rights law, you should be entitled to a defense and you should not be penalized for raising that issues if other avenues are not realistically open to you. So that's a simple question. I, want, I wanted to, hmm? including the media, yes. Parliamentarians and the media, you remember the, um, the issue of the Belgrano when somebody alerted a parliamentarian um, about what had happened. So that's another possibility. Parliamentarians and the media, responsible media. And of course, whistleblowers have responsibilities too. So who they select to leak to is part of the, of the assessment, I suppose. But if they go to a responsible press, they speak of Washington Post, The Guardian, then um, that shows that they are inherently be trying to be responsible in the way they, uh, they leak information. Um, I also wanted to highlight just that we've been training, I've been training human rights defenders in Central Asia and Uzbekistan and, and, um, and, and, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we've been giving them these, um, these tools to try and protect themselves and at the same time the governments are undermining those very tools. It's just outrageous. Sorry, I realise. No, apologies okay. from our side. Uh, committee meetings will start at two o'clock. It's three minutes past two, so Many thanks for coming to Strasbourg. Know that we will have two other hearings on whistleblowing one and the other one on uh, the mass surveillance in the April part session. I hope to see all of you there as well. Uh, thanks again and thanks for the questions and I close the meeting.